When I started doing this podcast, I knew it was going to be a great opportunity to read a lot of books that have been on my list that I knew I wanted to explore but haven't gotten the time to. And I assumed it would be a great opportunity to revisit some old favorites. And as soon as I started doing it and started talking about it on social media, I had people reaching out saying, hey, you should do one on finite and infinite games. And here we are. This is probably the book that I've reread the most at times. I've gone through it a bunch. If you're watching, then you can see the ridiculous number of sticky tabs that I have on it. And one, it helps that it's short, <laughs> makes it easier to revisit it. Uh, and two, this book more than almost any other is just really special for making me think about the world in a different way. If I had to encapsulate the way of thinking that that is so magical with this book is it trips you into kind of a mindfulness, peacefulness with the world that you might get through meditation or doing a bunch of mushrooms, uh, but in a more logical, cognitive, reason-based way. It's interesting that some of the ideas in here are ideas that came up in uh, John Gray's Straw Dogs, which was episode number two, if you haven't listened to that one, uh, but pr presented in a very different style. And it, this book and that book really are not similar, but they end up arriving at, at some similar places. This book is weird. Uh, it's kind of aphoristic. It's the ideas seem strange at first in a lot of sections. Uh, and you do kind of have to sit with it. You can just read it straight through, or you can read a chapter or two, let it sit, come back to it, think about it for a bit. But there there really isn't a, a linear narrative or even a specific main argument that we're hammering at. There is a core idea that we will keep returning back to, but then there's a lot of uh, jumps off from that idea. So this podcast episode is going to be a little more choose your own adventure. -y. It might be easier to jump around in this one than some other ones, or you can just hang out with me for the next however many minutes as I go through one of my favorite books in the world. And I'm very happy you're here. And if you're enjoying this show, I would really appreciate it if you sent it to one other person who you think might enjoy it. All right, so the first topic that we're going to jump into is that there are two kinds of games, finite games and infinite games. And before we do, I just wanna remind you about Readwise. That's readwise.io slash nat. This is the ultimate reading tool. I use it to read all articles and things online, organize all of my highlights and things that I wanna remember from them and to organize all of my highlights from books. If you're reading on Kindle or iBooks, it can automatically pull out all of your highlights. Or if you prefer physical copies like me, you can just literally point your camera at it with the Readwise app, take a picture, select your highlights, and then it saves your highlights from that physical book to your digital database. You can keep them in Readwise. You can automatically send them to Notion or Evernote or whatever else you use. Uh, and it really, really helps me make sure that you're getting the most out of every book you read. I love it. I use it every day. Definitely check it out. It's readwise.io slash nat. All right. So into Finite and Infinite Games by James P. Cars. Now let's start with the big topic of the book, finite games versus infinite games. The book starts off with there are at least two kinds of games. One could be called finite and the other infinite. A finite game is played for the purpose of winning, an infinite game for the purpose of continuing the play. And off the bat, I think it's important to clarify here that game does not necessarily mean checkers or football. He's basically encouraging you to look at everything you do in life as a game. So a finite game might be, again, chess or a game of football, whereas an infinite game would be something like learning or fitness. Uh, the finite game is bounded. It has rules. It has a way for you to win or lose. An infinite game is something that can be done uh, forever. You play it to keep playing it versus playing it to win. And this kind of sets the tone for a lot of the other topics that come up in the book, because you need to have this idea in your head. You need to have this lens to look at life through of, is this thing that I'm considering a finite game or an infinite game? We're all choosing to play and engage in different games every day. And the mentality that you have is going to vary greatly depending on if you are in a finite game or an infinite game. Simply the difference between I want to win and I want to get better are two fundamental mindsets of finite and infinite games that you can choose to adopt. And if you are living primarily in a finite game world, you are going to have more of a competitive me versus you winner take all mentality. If you're living and thinking in a more infinite game world, you're you're going to naturally feel a little more generous or positive about uh, playing it because you don't see it as a thing that you can win or lose. You are playing to keep playing. 
And something that Cars points out right away is that you can't really be forced to play a game. You are always choosing to engage in a game, whether you are consciously aware of your choice or not. So a little bit further on, he points out that rules are not valid because the Senate passed them or because heroes once played by them or because God pronounced them through Moses or Muhammad. They are valid only if and when players freely play by them. There are no rules that require us to obey rules. If there were, they would have to be a rule for those rules and so on. So e even if you might think that you have to do something, that you have to follow a rule, you are ultimately choosing to comply with it. You're, you're always choosing to follow the rules. You're always choosing to play the game uh, that you are playing. And one of the hallmarks of a finite player versus an infinite player is that a finite player thinks that whatever they do, they must do. He says, although it may be evident enough in theory that whoever plays a finite game plays freely, it is often the case that finite players will be unaware of this absolute freedom and will come to think that whatever they do, they must do. One of the examples he gives is that since finite games are played to be won, players make every move in a game in order to win it. Whatever is not done in the interest of winning is not part of the game. The constant attentiveness of finite players to the progress of the competition can lead them to believe that every move they make, they must make. But obviously you always have other options that are beyond the confines of the game, like simply not playing at all. And that might be obvious in a chess game, but it's less obvious in the other games of life. While no one is forced to remain a lawyer or a rodeo performer or a kudalini yogi after being selected for those roles, each role is nonetheless surrounded both by ruled restraints and expectations on the part of others. One senses a compulsion to maintain a certain level of performance because permission to play in these games can be canceled. We cannot do whatever we please and remain lawyers or yogis, and yet we could not be either unless we pleased. So he's saying that once you are in one of these games, you will often feel that you have to keep doing uh, certain things because you want to stay within the boundaries of that game. But you are ultimately just choosing to do that. Whatever you think you have to do, you are actually choosing to do on some level. And so finite players tend to think, oh, I have to do these things, whereas an infinite player recognizes that those are merely choices uh, to continue playing or not playing whatever finite game you find yourself in at that time. He has this great line shortly before this where he says, no limitation may be imposed against infinite play because since limits are taken into play, the play itself cannot be limited. Finite players play within boundaries. Infinite players play with boundaries. So whenever you find yourself thinking, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, that's not how it's done, this is how it's done, I need to follow this structure, follow these rules, you are in, an, you are in a finite game mindset. When you are seeing the world as opportunity and seeing all of these rules, structures, whatever, it's just like guidelines you can choose to follow or not, and you're playing with the limits of what's possible, that's when you're more of an infinite player. And another way that this manifests that he points out is that we don't actually uh, compete with nature or struggle with nature, we struggle within nature. There certainly are acts of government or acts of nature or acts of God that far exceed any contravening ability of our own but it is unlikely that we would consider ourselves losers in retaliation to them. We are not defeated by floods or genetic disease or the rate of inflation. It is true that these are real, but we do not play against reality. We play according to reality. We do not eliminate weather or genetic influence, but accept them as the realities that establish the context of play, the limits within which we are to play. If I accept death as inevitable, I do not struggle against mortality. I struggle as a mortal. Really interesting, subtle distinction there. Are you fighting against nature or are you struggling within the given boundaries of nature? All limitations of finite play are self-limitations. In most cases, we choose whatever cage we are living in, either real or imagined. And the more you recognize that, the more you can realize just how few limits there actually are on what you do, how you play, how you succeed, thrive, live, whatever it is you're trying to do. And the last thought that I'll, I'll cite on this kind of like playing within uh, boundaries that he chooses is that he talks about the law and government, right? And this is an interesting cultural difference, right? If you pull up to a stoplight in the middle of the night and there's nobody else around, do you stop at it, right? Okay, kind of interesting 
a question of your individual philosophy on law and culture, where he says, uh, only by free self-concealment can persons believe they obey the law because the law is powerful. In fact, the law is powerful for persons only because they obey it. The law doesn't inherently have power. We give it power by continuing to follow it. We do not proceed through a traffic intersection because the signal changes, but when the signal changes. Again, we are consciously choosing at all times to continue following these rules. We give them power. So it's worth asking yourself, what boundaries am I honoring or giving power to that I maybe don't have to give power to in my life? Like what rules am I playing by that I don't have to follow? What expectations am I playing by that I don't have to follow? What finite games am I stuck in that I might not be fully aware of? I love that idea that all limitations are self-limitations, or at least the limits, the limitations of finite play, right? We're, we're always choosing to play by these rules. Uh, and speaking of play, there's this interesting idea of playfulness, because even though you obviously play both kinds of games, there's a certain characteristic of playfulness that is inherently uh, conducive to more infinite games, infinite play. To be playful is not to be trivial or frivolous, or to act as though nothing of consequence will happen. On the contrary, when we are playful with each other, we relate as free persons and the relationship is open to surprise. Everything that happens is of consequence. It is, in fact, seriousness that closes itself to consequence, for seriousness is a dread of the unpredictable outcome of open possibility. To be serious is to press for a specified conclusion. To be playful is to allow for possibility whatever the cost to oneself. And this is easy to imagine that usually when somebody's being serious, they're trying to enforce a certain structure, a certain set of rules that maybe not everybody wants to play by. Being playful is being open to the rules changing, to the field of play changing. It's being open to those new experiences. And so the more playful you are, the more inherently infinite you will be and vice versa too. The more infinitely you are thinking with the boundaries that you allow to exist in your life, the more playful and open to change and unpredictability you'll be as well. This challenge is commonly misunderstood as the need to find room for playfulness within finite games. This is what was referred to as playing at, or perhaps playing around, a kind of play that has no consequences. This is the sort of playfulness implied in the ordinary sense of such terms as entertainment, amusement, diversion, comic relief, recreation, relaxation. Inevitably, however, seriousness will creep back into this kind of play. The executive's vacation, like the football team's time out, comes to be a device for refreshing the contestant for a higher level of competition. Even the open playfulness of children is exploited through organized athletic, artistic, and educational regimens as a means of preparing the young for serious adult competition. It's really clear that the, a lot of things we think of as like playful, right? You know, watching a movie or something like that's not really play because we're just doing it to relax and recover from these other finite games that we're obsessed with often work, right? The, the vacation, especially taking two weeks to go sit on a beach to recover so that you can, you know, come back to work refreshed is not really playfulness. We talked about this in, in Straw Dogs too, uh, where we can't really actually be idle and relax anymore because we see idleness as a means to an end. We think that it's part of how we get ready for more serious hard work. And that's not really being playful. That's not really relaxing. And one of the best ways to tell if you're in true infinite play or just in you know, like fake playfulness is surprise. Uh, infinite players continue their play in the expectation of being surprised. If surprise is no longer possible, all play ceases. You, you sort of need surprise and novelty for infinite play to continue. If there are no surprises, it's a finite fixed game. Surprise causes finite play to end. It is the reason for infinite play to continue. So that's kind of a good heuristic you can use. If, if some major surprise, major shock like ended this game, then it must be a finite game. If it simply changed the way the game was played, but the play continued in some new and interesting way, then it's probably a type of infinite game. And this idea of seriousness is really important, right? And this is another great heuristic, right? The more serious you feel compelled to be, the more you are probably playing by a very limiting set of other people's rules because true infinite creative play is inherently unserious, or at least playful. Infinite players are not serious actors in any story, but the joyful poets of a story that continues to originate what they cannot finish. And so I love, I love this idea as a way of thinking about 
uh, anything that you're caught up in, right? The more you feel bound to a set of rules, the more serious the effort feels, the more it's inherently finite and the more you might need to think a little broader, think more creatively. Because this is a really interesting distinction that I've never thought of before. You might think that strength and power are the same thing, but they're another part of the finite infinite dichotomy. He says, uh, power is a future only of finite games. Where the finite player plays to be powerful, the infinite player plays with strength. A powerful person is one who brings the past to an outcome, settling all its unresolved issues. A strong person is one who carries the past into the future, showing that none of its issues is capable of resolution. Power is concerned with what has already happened, strength with what has yet to happen. Power is finite in amount, strength cannot be measured, because it is an opening and not a closing act. So th this sounds kind of weird, but essentially what he's getting at is that you have power for winning earlier finite games, and then you can bring that power to future games to try to preemptively resolve them with the power you've already earned. Whereas strength is your ability to perform uh, in future challenges, in future aspects of an infinite game. If you're focused on power, you're focused on winning, you're focused on getting titles, things that are all uh, inherit to finite games. But if you're just becoming stronger, whatever that means, physically, mentally, uh, and so on, then you're just preparing yourself for these continuing infinite games of life. It says power will always be restricted to a relatively small number of selected persons. Anyone can be strong. So strength is really a, a much better goal than power. At least if you agree that infinite games are more worth playing than finite ones, right? Because I said earlier that competition is, is kind of inherently a finite game thing. And he says that uh, a people, as a people, has nothing to defend. In the same way, a people has nothing and no one to attack. One cannot be free by opposing another. My freedom does not depend on your loss of freedom. On the contrary, since freedom is never freedom from society, but freedom for it, my freedom inherently affirms yours. A people has no enemies. So this idea that as long as you think of yourself as opposing someone, you are not free, right? Because as soon as you've chosen an enemy, you've chosen a combatant, you've chosen someone to compete with for whatever it is you're imagining, you need to fight for maybe power, resources, something else, you are no longer free either. Freedom is kind of a mutual assurance. Infinite players have no interest in restricting the freedom of another to one's own boundaries of play. Infinite players recognize choice in all aspects. They may see in themselves and in others, for example, the infant's desire to compete for the mother, but they also see that there is neither physiological nor societal destiny. Whoever chooses to compete with another can also choose to play with another. And, and another big area where this topic of like power and competition and... Uh, these zero-sum games or these kind of like thinking much larger uh, types of perspective come in is in wealth right, and resources because that's another area where a lot of people think that you can't become wealthy except at the expense of, of someone else and that's simply not true. And he points out how this manifests in, in power, right? The more powerful we consider persons to be, the less we expect them to do for their power can come only from that which they have done. After athletic contests in which major titles have been at stake, it is common for the audience to lift the winners to their shoulders, marching them about as if they were helpless, in the sharpest possible contrast to the physical skill and energy they have just displayed. Monarchs and divinities are often borne on ceremonial transports. The very wealthy are driven in carriages or limousines. Consumption is an activity so different from gainful labor that it shows itself in the mode of leisure, even indolence. We display the success of what we have done by not having to do anything. The more we use up, therefore, the more we show ourselves to be the winners of past contests. Conspicuous abstention from labor, therefore, becomes the conventional mark of superior pecuniary achievement and the conventional index of reputability. And conversely, since application to productive labor is a mark of poverty and subjugation, it becomes inconsistent with a reputable standing in the community. So we have this kind of interesting trade-off, right? Where we fight for power, we fight for victory, and then the way we show that we are victorious is by not doing that thing anymore. Like this is really the sign of a finite game. If 
it's something that you have to work very hard at. And then as soon as you get it, you stop doing it. That is a finite game. And this is something else he talks about with school, right? Where the difference between uh, school and the, the like grade and college system and actual education is that an education is something that goes on forever. It is never ending. There is no way to win at education. There is no end goal. Whereas school, which is much more like training, does have a completion criteria. There is a way to win. You do get a grade. You use it to get a job. And then you basically forget most of what uh, you learned during your, your training. And so if you're thinking of something as a means to an end, uh, a victory to be accomplished so that you no longer have to do that thing, then you are in a finite game. You are in a struggle for power. And perhaps there is a more infinite way to look at whatever it is that you're doing. And one of the consequences of, of wealth and victory and all these things is that you kind of have to keep doing it. He says, winners, especially celebrated winners, must prove repeatedly that they are winners. The script must be played over and over again. Titles must be defended by new contests. No one is ever wealthy enough, honored enough, applauded enough. On the contrary, the visibility of our victories only tightens the grip of the failures in our invisible past. So it creates this vicious cycle where the more we win, the more we feel like we need to win to continue showing ourselves to be winners. The more you index your reputation on uh, these finite games, on these closed systems, the more you need to continue going back to the well, keep doing them in order to keep proving that you are a winner. An infinite player just wants to keep playing whatever game they were already playing. There was no end to it in the first place. They don't care about the titles or these signs of victory. And so they just keep playing the game. Where he says, schools are a species of finite play to the degree that they bestow ranked awards on those who win degrees from them. Those awards in turn qualify graduates for competition in still higher games, certain prestigious colleges, for example, and then certain professional schools beyond that, with a continuing sequence of higher games in each of the professions and so forth. It is not uncommon for families to think of themselves as a competitive unit in a broader finite game for which they are training their members in the struggle for societally visible titles. That's just so well put, right? It's so easy to get caught in, in this school game, both as a kid and as a parent, right? And think that these, these random accolades are super important, but you're just stuck in the confines of this very limited finite game. You're not treating education and learning as this infinite ever occurring game. And I think the latter is just much healthier because the, the, the dark obsession with um, perfect grades, performance, getting to the best college, getting an impressive job, uh, you know, tends to make pretty miserable. And they, they wake up from it eventually. So I, I like that infinite game approach to, to education and learning. So let's continue then with this idea of self-limitations, because another way that comes into play is this topic of boundaries that we've started to touch on, where whenever you're, you're in a finite game, you are, you are seeing the limits of play, right? Uh, every move an infinite player makes is toward the horizon. Every move made by a finite player is within a boundary. Every moment of an infinite game, therefore, presents a new vision, a new range of possibilities. The Renaissance, like all genuine cultural phenomena, was not an effort to promote one or another vision. It was an effort to find visions that promised still more vision. So it is just another interesting way to think about the things you're doing. Are you playing within rules or are you moving towards some greater horizon? And as you move towards it, you are discovering new forms of play, new ways to express yourself, things to experience. You know, how rigid do the boundaries of your life feel because that's one of the strongest signs that you're stuck uh, in some sort of finite limited game. And he goes on to say that a lot of this is a matter of perspective. The strategy of infinite players is horizontal. They do not go to meet putative enemies with power and violence, but with poises and vision. They invite themselves to become a people in passage. Infinite players do not rise to meet arms with arms. Instead, they make use of laughter, vision, and surprise to engage the state and put its boundaries back into play. What will undo any boundary is the awareness that it is our vision and not what we are viewing that is limited. So again, coming back to this theme that a lot of your limitations are self-limitations. They're your unwillingness to go beyond the rules of the games that you have opted into or your unwillingness to see the boundaries for what they are. And another area where this comes in is, is with time. So he explains how time changes in finite versus infinite games. A finite game occurs within time. Because it has its boundaries, its beginning and end within the absolute temporal limits established by a world, time for a finite player runs out. It is used up. It is a diminishing quantity. 
A finite game does not have its own time, it exists in a world's time. An audience allows players only so much time to win their titles. Early in a game, time seems abundant, and there appears a greater freedom to develop future strategies. Late in a game, time is rapidly being consumed. As choices become more limited, they become more important. Errors are more disastrous. We look on childhood and youth as those times of life rich with possibility only because there still seem to remain so many paths open to a successful outcome. Each year that passes, however, increases the competitive value of making strategically correct decisions. The errors of childhood can be more easily amended than those of adulthood. For the finite player, freedom is a function of time. We must have time to be free. So the more you're thinking that you, you need time, right? You need more time, you need more time. That's kind of an inherently uh, finite focus because you're thinking of the game as being bounded uh, in some way. The infinite player in us does not consume time, but generates it. Because infinite play is dramatic and has no scripted conclusion, its time is time lived and not time viewed. Time does not pass for an infinite player. Each moment of time is a beginning. The horizon keeps moving. An infinite player does not begin working for the purpose of filling up a period of time with work, but for the purpose of filling work with time. Work is not an infinite player's way of passing time, but of engendering possibility. Work is not a way of arriving at a desired present and securing it against an unpredictable future, but of moving toward a future which itself has a future. It's really this kind of like scarcity mindset towards work and time. The more you're obsessed with using your time as efficiently as possible in order to create some future that you want to live in, you're playing a very finite game. The more you are seeing your days as opportunities to pour your time into the things you care about because you are continually creating a new and exciting future for yourself and are not trying to arrive at a certain predetermined state, the more you are in a mindset of infinite play and infinite games. Infinite players cannot say how much they have completed in their work or love or quarreling, but only that much remains incomplete in it. They are not concerned to determine when it is over, but only what comes of it. For the finite player in us, freedom is a function of time. We must have the time to be free. For the infinite player in us, time is a function of freedom. We are free to have time. A finite player puts play into time. An infinite player puts time into play. So then from time, we can move into another big topic around like nature and control. Our attempts to exercise power over nature mask our desire for power over each other. We, we've had this really species long struggle against nature for control. And in some ways it represents our desire to control each other as well. And he uses this to draw the distinction between uh, what he calls like the machine and the garden. Basically things that we create that are more mechanistic and things that are natural uh, and organic, right? Like nature itself. He says the alternative attitudes towards nature can be characterized in a rough way by saying that the result of approaching nature as a hostile other whose designs are basically inimical to our interests is the machine, while the result of learning to discipline ourselves to consist with the deepest discernible patterns of natural order is the garden. Machine is used here as inclusive of technology and not as an example of it, as a way of drawing attention to the mechanical rationality of technology. Garden does not refer to the bounded plot at the edge of the house or the market of the city. This is not a garden one lives beside, but a garden one lives within. It is a place of growth, of maximized spontaneity. To garden is not to engage in a hobby or an amusement. It is to design a culture capable of adjusting to the widest possible range of surprise in nature. And then he goes on to explain that the most elemental difference between the machine and the garden is that one is driven by a force which must be introduced from without, the other grown by an energy which originates from within itself. And this is a really, it's just another great way to think about these finite versus infinite games in our lives. Anything that you must force yourself to do or that requires like force to continue is, is this machine, is this sort of finite bounded game. Anything that is, uh, self-continuing, self-supporting that you just organically put more time and energy into, that is the garden. That is the infinite game of your life and is the one that you might want to, to trend more towards. And he, one example that he gives is that while machinery is meant to work changes without changing its operators, gardening transforms its workers. 
One learns how to drive a car, one learns to drive as a car, but one becomes a gardener. Gardening is not outcome oriented. A successful harvest is not the end of a garden's existence, but only a phase of it. As any gardener knows, the vitality of a garden does not end with a harvest. It simply takes another form. Gardens do not die in the winter, but quietly prepare for another season. Gardeners celebrate variety, unlikeness, spontaneity. They understand that an abundance of styles is in the interest of vitality. The more complex the organic content of the soil, for example, that is, the more numerous its sources of change, the more vigorous its liveliness. Growth promotes growth. There's a fun tie-in from episode one about what your food ate, right? It's so important to have this natural variety to create all of this various spontaneous growth in life. And if you're gardening, if you're an infinite player, then you like having this tons of variety, all of this surprise. If you're more mechanistic, if you're a more finite player, then you want an extremely rigid system that you can exert your will over and kind of control from the outside. And it's interesting to think about the consequences of trying to exert that much control because he says that the contradiction in our relation to nature is that the more vigorously we attempt to force its agreement with our own designs, the more subject we are to its indifference, the more vulnerable to its unseeing forces. The more power we exercise over natural process, the more powerless we become before it. And then the, the other interesting contradiction there is what machines do to us. Uh, because we make use of machinery in the belief we can increase the range of our freedom, and instead we only decrease it. We use machines against ourselves. And one example of what he means by that is uh, travel, right? So, and there's, there's kind of like this finite versus infinite player in, in travel too. He says, we do not move from our point of departure, but with our point of departure. To be moved from our living room by an automobile whose upholstered seats differ scarcely at all from those in our living rooms, to an airport waiting room, and then to the airplane where we are provided the same sort of furniture, is to have taken our origin with us. It is to have left home without leaving home. To be at home everywhere is to neutralize space. Therefore, the importance of reducing time in travel. By arriving as quickly as possible, we need not feel as though we had left at all. That neither space nor time can affect us as though they belong to us and not we to them. We do not go somewhere in a car, but arrive somewhere in a car. Automobiles do not make travel possible, but make it possible for us to move locations without traveling. Genuine travel has no destination. Travelers do not go somewhere, but constantly discover they are somewhere else. The motels around the airports in Chicago and Atlanta are so little different from the motels around the airports of Tokyo and Frankfurt that all essential distances dissolve in likeliness. What is truly separated is distinct. It is unlike. The only true voyage would be not to travel through a hundred different lands with the same pair of eyes, but to see the same land through a hundred different pairs of eyes. So when you're essentially having the same experience everywhere and going to all these similar places, you are not really traveling. You might be traveling more to go around the corner and live as somebody in a totally different social class of your existing city, than to live essentially the same life you're living here in another similar city in the world. And then finally, we come to this power of stories. And how stories have this organic, infinite quality to them too. A story attains the status of myth when it is retold and persistently retold solely for its own sake. Our first response to hearing a story is the desire to tell it ourselves. The greater the story, the greater the desire. We will go to considerable time and inconvenience to arrange a situation for its retelling. It is as though the story is itself seeking the occasion for its recurrence, making use of us as its agents. We do not go out searching for stories for ourselves. It is rather the stories that have found us for themselves. Stories that have the enduring strength of myths reach through experience to touch the genius in each of us. But experience is the result of this generative touch, not its cause. So far is this the case that we can even say that if we cannot tell a story about what happened to us, nothing has happened to us. These really incredible, almost like magical forms of information that just naturally spread. But there's an important distinction between what a myth or a story does, which is resonates, right? It resonates, it grows and grows as more people retell it. The opposite of resonance is amplification. A choir is the unified expression of voices resonating with each other. 
A loudspeaker is the amplification of a single voice excluding all others. The loudspeaker successfully muting all other voices and therefore all possibility of conversation is not listened to at all, and for that reason loses its own voice and becomes mere noise. Whenever we succeed in being the only speaker, there is no speaker at all. And so I love this idea that uh, an idea only has power if it resonates and naturally amplifies, if it or, and naturally spreads through resonance. If it has to be amplified artificially, then it will naturally push people away. And I'm sure you've had this experience too of feeling like some idea was being forced on you versus naturally discovering it through it resonating with other people. The latter feels very organic. It feels natural. It feels like something we want to adopt. When it feels like an idea is being forced upon us through some sort of amplification, it, it naturally repels us. There's something disgusting and repugnant about it. So there, there are so many ways that this idea of finite versus infinite games plays out. Uh, and then he leaves you with the, the last line of the book with, uh, there is but one infinite game. It, it's a great book for just making you think about your life in different ways, really starting to use those lenses of, is this a finite game or an infinite game? If you enjoy this, I release a new in-depth book summary every week. So make sure you subscribe to get it. And thank you so much for watching.